Happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm on with my guy, Dakota. How you doing? I'm doing all right, brother, man. Doing all right. Okay, yeah, that's great. And as always. Yeah, that's great. We're, we're all caught up now. We're, we're reacquainted. So let's get back into what we need to get into. That's boxing talk. William Zapata, just how freaking good is he? Dude, I I thought this fight was going to kind of answer some of that question, man. I was a little bit blown away, honestly. Like, he's been impressive before. But when you have a guy with, with this the, the, the gift of punching the way that he does, you always question, okay, how is he going to react to somebody with this kind of style? And in general, I've always been impressed with how Maxi Hughes is able to keep guys off balance. And Zapata really just didn't give him any opportunity to get any of that going outside of the first 30 seconds of every round. Um, and he really just beat it out of him. It was with volume. It was with accuracy. Um, it was with pretty decent defense. I'm, I, I, I was I was kind of blown away, bro. I was very impressed. I lost my tab there. So thank you guys to people jumping in the chat already um, there. To me, I mean, to me, William Zapata feels like one of the most interesting fighters. Uh, kind of a super heat check this week to compare him to Salvador Sanchez, who might be the best Mexican fighter ever. I mean, not to say he isn't a great fighter. I think he is a great fighter. I just think it's always tough when a guy hasn't won a world title and we're comparing him to like a historic great fighter it's kind of sets the bar at a very high standard yet i will say with this type of performance the pay to lived up to that possible standard he looks like an emerging talent right hey, sweet sam shout out and one thing i want to bring up is maxi hughes has issues boxing scene brought it up that he got deported at aspects do you factor in any of the outside things like getting deported, having issues with camp, playing into this not being the same Maxi Hughes we had seen in the Cambosis fight? I'm I'm unaware what what happened exactly. Well, let me get the story up. So make some observations and then I'll point it up. Oh, see, you're doing the sneaky typing. Um, so I I'm unaware of any of that happening. I can't speak to that, but what I can say is that. Um, Max Hughes looked just as resilient as he ever has. He looked just as willing to fight as he ever did. I actually think his willingness to engage and try to get Cepeda's respect was kind of his downfall because I feel like with Cepeda, the minute you give him that one, you know, that that solitary moment where he's able to kind of let his offense go, if he gets any kind of head of steam going, he's just a lot to handle, bro. Okay, so here's the story. Um, Hughes thought he'd be fine. He boxed Cambosis in Oklahoma last July, but he was pulled into an office upon landing in Las Vegas and then put straight on a flight back home with the rest of his team waiting for him in arrivals back in the U.S. So I flew out on my birthday, March 4th, and we had a gym lined up, sparring partners, etc. And then um, he had to go straight back on a plane. Yeah, it was an, So he basically did back-to-back 11-hour -back flights. Um, I'm looking for when he got back. Basically, there was just so nine days. If I'm reading this right, and that's always a big thing, uh, he was able to come back nine days before his fight. So he was he was trying to get here March 4th. There were issues. It got sorted, but that does that would have mean that he came March 7th or 8th, which would have meant that he missed out on potentially four to five days of camp at a very pivotal point in that camp. And I think the other more important thing to me is he took three 11 hour plane rides consecutively to the dome, which I don't care who you are. That's really hard. Like those long flights are hard to handle. They're hard to handle. That's not that much time to recover. I mean, it is. It, I guess I should say it's enough time to recover, but the cumulative effect of having a camp interruption like that, you you don't know what it's going to be. That being said, I don't think he would blame the performance on that. I think that that you know every every fighter has some sort of complication in a camp that the public is unaware of. Um, <clears throat> so I I don't know that I'm prepared to jump to that conclusion when he still had nine ten days to recover from it. As okay. much as it is unfortunate. 
So Jesus M is saying Zapata is strategically being matched to get a payday versus top guys like Munguia versus Canelo. See, I'm going to push back on this a little bit because Munguia's or Zapata's fought some top contenders, like we said, like Hector Tananahara. That was a 50 50 prospect fight. Tananahara kind of disappeared. He was the B side. He was the B side. He was the B side in that fight. And then also, he had a fight on Fight City against, I want to say, an undefeated fighter at the time. He was an unheralded guy. I don't even know if he was with Golden Boy. Wins that fight. And then he beat Jojo Diaz, and that was looked at as a fairly even type match. I think the thing that we've talked about, or I've talked about, and I love bringing up my points because I'm selfish, is Zapata's had that unfortunate situation where the guys he's beat haven't gotten a marquee win after he beat them. So every fight is aging historically bad and no one's remembering what the guys were doing prior to that fight because that JoJo had given Devin Haney a very competitive fight and people were wondering, like, how is this going to mm-hmm. be for Data? After that fight, he breaks CompuBox records for punch totals in the lightweight division and everyone goes, ah, oh, JoJo's on a slide. So I, I get what you're saying, Jesus M, but I think also Zapata's a real guy in this division. And a lot of what he does might actually impact guys moving forward and their success at the highest level. Well, and to be fair, too, I think him beating Max Hughes in this manner, it doesn't mean that I think he's going to do that to Shakur or to Tank, right? All it means is that sometimes with punchers, a certain style can can be a kryptonite to them. I don't think just being a good mover is going to be enough to beat Zapata. You're going to have to have some kind of power. You're going to have to have an X factor that's going to keep him off of you, even if it's just that you have better footwork than Maxi Hughes. You have a better jab than Maxi Hughes. Um, I, I just thought it was impressive that he's able to take somebody that's been that tricky through the years and make it look that easy. I'm not also. I'm also not prepared to say that he would beat Shakur. I think that I like his chances a lot more in a fight like that now, but he still he still has yet to fight an elite level guy like that really outside of JoJo. And uh, hey, Susem, thank you for contributing. Zapata lacks defense and throws arm punches. At, he says and arm punches, which I assume he means. And no way Zapata is matched versus Raymond Muratala because that is the end of Zapata. I mean, Raymond Muratala is our guy. We're both really big fans of that. That's a logical fight that I should that. happen because you got guys that are in the exact same position. They're beating guys, not getting credit for it. They're in that position where they should be fighting each other because that that creates a real world title contender. Will we see? Know. I would even argue, though, that Zapata's in a more like an Arlo Barbosa type situation where I feel like he's been in this next fight's the big one position for a long time, and and that hasn't happened. Well, let's get to the deeper conversation if we want to do that, right? We, let's go deep. It, this is what happens when divisions have undisputed champions. This is what happens when you have an undisputed champion because what's happening now is you're seeing one guy – okay, I have all the belts, so then they can't fight four number one contenders. And then because you can't fight the four number one contenders, guys have to take stay busy fights, but they don't want to give up their spot in the line or they want to put pressure on getting a title shot to get a vacant belt. And Undisputed's great because for the fans, we understand who the best guy is. But I think part of what's happened to Barbosa and Zapata is there's been one top dog in these divisions over the past couple of years, and those guys haven't gone their direction. And until there's a little bit more champions and more opportunities, it doesn't feel like they're going to get those breaks. Are you, are you referring just sort of to Haney having all four for a couple of years and that, I guess, preventing Zapata from having a title opportunity? Well, I, I think I think so because Haney – has taken great challenges and great opportunities. So I'd never question what Haney's done. But basically when Zapata emerged as a guy, right, it's when Devin kind of went and beat Cambosis. You know, it was kind of parallel to that. His rise kind of came at that same time. So basically his whole time of being a top 10 lightweight after the JoJo fight has been when there's only been one lightweight champion. And I think that's just been an issue, too, is what weight class does Devin fight at? Now, now Devin's at junior welter. Now there's some belts opening up. We're going to find out what's going on. Um, 
I believe this was a WBA and an IBF eliminator. So that gives him two options on the belts. That's helpful. But I, I can't, I hear what you're saying about the undisputed thing. I can't tell if that's an issue of having an undisputed champion or if it's an issue of the risk of taking a loss being too big. Like if the context of the loss, like as fans, we know, like if he loses a split decision to give to, to Moritaya, I, I don't think any less of him. But in their minds, it puts them in the back of the line. I just don't know that that's true anymore. And so it's that it is that thing of whether it's an undisputed champion or there's a cash cow in your weight class. I don't think it serves any of these guys to hold out, you know, 10 guys holding out for the same one fight. But Dakota, know? let's have the real conversation, right? It's St. Pat's Day. Let's have the real conversation. Do you really think it's the guys or do you think it's the promoters that don't want to have the leverage to get a big fight for their network? <laughs> but this is the short sightedness of that. Should William Zapata beat Morataya, he becomes one of the most desirable opponents to any big name in his weight class. So I think that's the disconnect where they think, oh, we've achieved the ranking. Now let's wait it out. And that almost never works, right? Especially if your guy isn't the money guy. So I think that it's it's short-sighted to, to, to do the holdout the way a lot of these guys have. Well, I think the problem is it's not the guy's. It's two different promoters, and the promoters would like to have all the control over it. And when you have two guys, typically one promoter is going to take a loss, and no one wants to enter into a 50-50 arrangement, it feels like, in modern boxing. So unless there's like a guy who's a 40-60, but they think they can win, but they know that they have to come in with less leverage, mm-hmm. or they're 80-20, and this is the best fight they can get, kind of like Maxi Hughes Zapata. Maxi's a good fighter. Coming off a loss, people thought he had won, but people favored Zapata, but this was a fantastic opportunity for Maxi Hughes. But I don't think people looked at this as a 50-50 fight on paper or the bookies, but it was a great opportunity for Maxi Hughes. You don't really see these 50-50 cross-promotion fights being made unless there's a lot of money being made, unless there's a high demand. We're not. We're not just seeing these fights organically made between promoters unless there's a form of necessity to it. Right. Like a, uh, you know, like a perfect example, we were on, um, on Cash and County the other night, me and Jack and those were talking about just kind of fantasy matchups. And one of the ones that I had thought of was Virgil Ortiz and, and Jesus Ramos. I mean, how great of a fight would that be? And once you start spitting out matchups, you realize like, wow, there's so many incredible fights that could be made and what a low percentage of them are being made even though i think it would help everyone's career and the sport well it's just the problem is the divided nature and the egos in the sport and it's not just one person but it's just the way people have been taught to think about boxing and i i always harpen back to the fact that networks have contracts with promoters hurts the sport because now the promoters are aligned to networks so then let's say you have a very exciting fighter like zapata Maybe he's aligned with the zone. Like they go, we want to have some dates with him. And then even if you can cross promote with top rank and you do the ESPN to zone, you could watch on both. Does the network now have an issue if the guy takes a loss or looks a certain way? And I think that it's a multifaceted approach where it's not just the promoter. It's not just the network. It's not just the fighter. It's like the network expects this. The promoter expects this. And then the fighter wants typically the best fights possible, but the business has to run how the business runs. And I feel oftentimes this might be beating a dead horse. It's the people that aren't boxing guys or boxing girls that are, that are causing the issue that are in corporate who are like, we need this perfect record, or we need to take this business approach to get the most out of this fighter when the boxing people typically are like, let's make the fight, let's roll the dice, let's see what happens. And I think that's the issue with the splintered nature of the sport is it's always some X factor business, not really boxing person talking about how can we broker power through arrangements. Yeah, it's the many the many hands in the fighter's pot, right? And I, it does kind of seem like at times that Zapata has been, again, I don't want to say a victim of that, but it does seem like he's been excluded from that big uh, next fight that's seemed to be on the horizon for him for a while now. I mean, and if you look at him, right, Mexican fighter, 
exciting style, throws a ton of punches. Hits um, hard as fuck. Not just a cumulative. He does hit really hard. He throws with intention. He's a very exciting fighter. There's elements to me that remind me of Chico Corrales to a certain degree. Um, I don't know how it will go, et cetera, but um, I think he's an interesting guy. And I also look, you look at his style, Jesus M, it's like in the chat saying, well, he's going to lose a fight. Is that going to ever impact you watching a William Zapata fight? And I think that's what hurts me about guys like Zapata and some of these guys, even Barbosa, exciting fighter. Just let them take these fights that they want because people are going to still tune in because the styles are exciting. And it, to me, it just kind of hurts because we look through this lightweight division and there's too many undefeated, talented fighters. We need to see some of these undefeated fighters match up against each other. And that, and like Jesus M is saying, Corrales defeats Zepeda. We don't even, well, first off, we can't even assess that because it's different eras. Second off, we can't even assess that because we're not even seeing Zapata in with the truly elite of his era. And that's how we start to determine that. What we know is he's better than the guys that give guys trouble, typically. He's graduated out of, in my opinion, the developmental circuit. He's a capital G guy in the division. Now he needs to fight other guys that have been brought up and money has been invested in. Yeah, you don't want him to fall into, a, you know, sort of a Giovanni Santian situation where it's just like the eternal prospect. Yeah, and then, you know, with Gio, he gets that opportunity and then he has his breakout performance, you know, and that's like a great example, right? He he um, did it. We got a question. Zapata might fight Shakur next, right? That's a Dakota question. What do you think, Dakota? I mean, he said in the interview, the post fight, that he's interested in that. Again, I can't speak to his business situation. If I had to guess, I feel like he'll wind up. I don't know what makes me feel this way, but I do feel like he'll wind up fighting the winner of Lomachenko and Cambosis. I feel like that'll probably be the easiest fight to make negotiation wise. And the winner of that fight would have a lot of leverage going into a super fight with Shakur with Tank, whoever that that other opponent would be, and and that also um, that also is a great fight for like sure. That's, that's a I, great fight. I think we both agree that Lomachenko is probably going to dominate that fight, and I think Lomachenko and Zapata is one of the best fights you can make at lightweight. I think they both kind of present the thing that the other one doesn't like, um, and that's what makes it interesting to me. We're going to learn where both fighters are in their careers if that fight were to happen. Let's just run through that. This is going to be a shorter show this week, first off, because it's St. Pat's Day, second off, because there's not a ton to talk about, if we're being honest. Floyd Schofield had a weird fight. Um, he fought in my preview, in every preview I did of this fight. I'm like, look, he's fighting a guy that's known to be a little bit of a dirty fighter. What happened? He fought a dirty fighter. That fight ended in DQ. Um, to me, this kind of just, I didn't expect a disqualification, but I expected this fight to be rough. I expected Floyd, a young fighter to get flustered. I expected possibly a cut from some type of fouling. It, it, it was a very dangerous fight just based on the reputation of the fighter that he faced because of the de deductions he had fought, faced when he fought Sterling Castillo, that was his last loss. And it's hard to for me to believe that that's a one-off when guys are losing a fight and then they revert to fouling. It feels like that's a temperament issue. Um, what did you think of that? I, I, I first want to give credit to Floyd for maintaining his composure and kind of just staying the course because it wasn't it wasn't a fight that was ever going to present like an opportunity for him to look good or to do what he does. So. I just respect how he stayed within himself. Um, you know, what was the what was the opponent's name again? I have to look it up, but it's like Sirio. Sirio. Well, we'll we'll just. We'll, we'll. I'll get the research. I don't want to disrespect the guy, so let me let me do it. I'm going to be a professional here because just to, just to be respectful, right? But yeah, it, it felt like. He was somebody who had zero control over his emotions. It seemed like he was so out of control of his emotions that even when he was 
uh, picking Schofield up on his shoulder. Even when he was hitting him low twice in the clinch, he seemed to have no sense that that wasn't acceptable. And then after the fight, he was emotional and he was yelling. And um, he just seems like an unpredictable guy. I don't think that that should be rewarded in top-level boxing. It seems like kind of a Curtis Harper situation where you can market some of that like, oh, what's he going to do next? But I don't think that that means that you deserve to fight on TV either. Estrio Cerio, Ceruo. Yeah. Um, and I mean, what have we learned? Like when guys kind of do weird stuff like this, sometimes it's rewarded, you know? But I think it's, 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 it's that weird, what is he going to do next marketing that ultimately just winds up in bad fights for the most part. I mean, I can't remember ever being like, wow, that Curtis Harper fight was real memorable. Yeah, I mean, it's just. And then Jesus Sam said, Solos kept doing what you were doing, what uh, be, keep doing what you're doing because the ref is on his side. Solos is horrible. Oh, I mean, that's I noticed, that. I noticed that multiple times he was saying to Suero, Oh, you just keep doing what you're doing. He's the one that's trying to rough you up. I was surprised. I, you know, maybe he was trying to play psychologist in the corner and he's like, You know, I got to take the kid's side because he's losing control of himself. But I didn't think that was the best approach. Do you think that part of that too is like you got a kid who's a dirty fighter, a rough house fighter, you know, he's not going to be able to outbox the guy more than likely. So it's like you're flirting with danger doing that because it can lead to a DQ, but it's also kind of like, you know what you got and you just got to kind of lean into what the fighter is. He's a rough house fighter. I mean, I'm not advocating or, whatever but it just seems like he kind of is speaking the language of what the fighter does i also think you got to keep it real though you got to say hey look we got to get control of ourselves here a little bit you're going to get kicked out of this fight if you don't try to get control of your emotions that's you know what i mean you got to have that reality check too i don't love it i don't love it bro because i like the bobby bentons you know bobby in the corner is one of my favorite coach because he'll tell you listen man i thought you lost that so I like a coach that just kind of keeps it. And I'm not saying he didn't keep it real, but I think that it was grounded a little too reassuring when they were flirting with a gray area um, of getting disqualified. I totally agree. Yeah, I don't love that. Um, not the strongest undercard if we're going to keep it all the way real. Uh, what do you want to say about this? Un I, I, I thought it was kind of soft, to be honest with you, man. That's that's mostly and you know no disrespect to any of the fighters it just wasn't it wasn't a great it, card. It just felt it felt very top heavy. It felt like Floyd Schofield's a guy that's going to be interesting. It felt like uh, it also felt like uh, Williams Pate is going to be in our life for a decade. But it also felt like these are some prospects. You know we got Joel or Arte, good fighter signs with Golden Boy does his thing you got eric priest but none of these guys have really created an emotional attachment with fans and they're kind of getting top billing on this card so it was it definitely felt like a mid-march card with other cards kind of sneaking up and listen eric priest is a good fighter you know it just wasn't it wasn't like the best performance it wasn't a matchup that i was particularly interested in and um you know, Look, in this spot, you're looking for someone to come out and make a statement and maybe get eyes going, okay, yeah. who's this guy? And I didn't quite see those performances, albeit I watched it back this morning. But I So then you kind of know, and it's not right to see it. But you didn't really see someone come out and, um, and kind of command your attention. Right, exactly. And I think that's, you know, it's... It, I think Golden Boy too. They don't always give you the long top rank matchroom cards that have you know the full undercard. So when you get four fights like that, you're looking for something a little stronger, I think. Yeah, or you're just looking for someone to say, "I don't belong on the undercard." Uh, I'm going to just make a statement, and then everyone's going to be interested in seeing me. And I, I, I want really Isley know. versus Hernandez. I want you know something, something to that effect. You just want it to look like there's separation. Um, Eric Priest versus Elijah Garcia. I just think uh, Jesus M brings that up. I just think that's guys at two different points in their career. I think Elijah is close to a world title shot. I think Eric Priest is nearing a point of fighting a 50-50 prospect fight. I think Elijah Garcia is well past the point of seeing if he can step up from prospect to contender. I think Elijah is a full-fledged contender at this point. 
I agree. Even though I do think that would be a good fight, I think at this particular point, Elijah would basically beat him up. It's just two guys in different points in their career. It's not to me. It's not a logical fight because it has nothing to do with the talent component. Eric is still developing as a professional. He's getting his reps in. He hasn't taken that jump. Elijah's fighting guys that realistically could beat him uh, for the past year. Like he's gotten in there with some very, very tough customers. Eric's a good fighter, but he has to take a couple of those fights with guys that I think are truly believing they're going to win. Guys who are doing full camps against him. That's a different animal. And when you got have guys step up against a young fighter like that, it's just tough. Um, what other fights from this weekend did you want to talk about? Well, this is kind of a random one, but um, on the, the Pro Box card the other day, Nicholas Flaz, I was very impressed with him. He's the guy that upset Jahai Tucker a couple of months ago. Um, you know, got knocked down the first round a couple of years ago and now beat a guy again. I'm struggling with names today. A guy that has been very I, I know this. This is Luke Santa Maria. He's a yeah, relative. Luke Santa Maria. Yeah, yeah. He's a tough guy. You know, they gotta draw with Marquise. You know what I mean? Luke Santa Maria's given a lot of tough guys a lot of issues. I felt like Flies kind of announced himself as a like a legitimate prospect. I mean, the guys won three straight upset wins. He beat Brian Sabello, took his undefeated record, beats Jahai Tucker. I think that was a very close fight that could have gone either way, to be honest with you, if I'm going to be real. And now he beats Luke Santa Maria. Who's well, let's been- even say that one was a draw, right? Which I think it probably was. The last three performances, I feel like he has kind of reinvented himself. I mean, he's now a can, he can really fight. And it feels yeah. like he might have not been training properly when he didn't have his distinguished record because it's looking like a situation changed and this is a world-class fighter i thought paulie and chris did a tremendous job on the telecast and i think that what really i saw was uh his hand speed and his rhythm and timing was just a nightmare for luke santa maria paul paulie made a great observation where santa maria likes to plant his feet stay in a spot and look to shoot punches Flaws was very rhythmic, had fast hands, and when Santa Maria would plant his feet, he would move, turn, and knew where Santa Maria was, and Santa Maria was not able to anticipate the shots coming from various angles, which led to him catching big shots. And I think that that was kind of the story of the fight right there was Santa Maria fought in a style that wasn't a good style for Flaws on that given night. Yeah, and I I think really what was impressive about that is he goes from a guy a couple years ago, again, getting stopped in the first round to now dominating a guy that I think you could say was a fringe contender, maybe even a legitimate contender who had been in there with some of the top guys, had always given a good accounting of himself, and Flaws did him in a way that I I don't think anybody has. And then that's a double-edged sword, right, because then we could also play haters on the front line, right? And we could also go, how much is that the accumulation of taking a bunch of hard fights and then it catches up to you on one night? And that's the tough thing about these because you don't know what's the truth. Because at a certain point, fighters just aren't the same anymore, too. Listen, you can make that argument about a guy who gets knocked out in the first round. So No, I get it. I get it. Santa Maria hadn't been knocked out in the first round. Yeah, I know. I get it. So, okay, we got that one. Um, Callum Walsh picked up a win in New York City. Uh, I was at the G Squad event. Gabriel looked great. Gabriel fought an undefeated guy, Julian Rodarte. Really tough guy, tough customer. Tricky, tricky opponent for an off television fight, to be honest with you. Fights a southpaw, pressure fighter, come forward. Everybody that, everything that people say Gabriel doesn't want to fight. And he, they said it was a split decision, but I felt like it was like an 8 2 7 3. One one judge saw it for the other guy. You know, that's fair. You know, that's fair. They can do it. But it was a good um, – I wouldn't say it's a comeback fight. He won. Um, let's see. Are you texting me, Dakota? No. No, I was actually looking up the opponent. Okay. So uh, I was just – People's names up, bro. <laughs> no, you're, doing, you're doing intel. I mean, that was, that was the main thing. Fernando Vargas Jr. got a knockout win over uh, veteran Brad Solomon. That's a good win for Fernando Vargas Jr. Sure. Uh, Solomon's a, a game veteran of the sport. Um, I thought in the first round, I told someone I was sitting by, I'd bet him $50 that it was going to go six rounds because 
Brad came out and he was doing that classic veteran thing where he wasn't throwing a ton of punches. He was propping his body on the ropes, but he knew how to just punch enough to keep the ref honest. And I felt like it was going to be a classic, great experience fight for Fernando Vargas Jr., but a terrible fight to watch. And then I went to the back, and then Fernando picked it up, got the stoppage, and everyone told me the minute I left ringside, it was a phenomenal fight. So shout out to Fernando Vargas Jr. because he's a good fighter, and he's he's moving up, and there's a there's a lot that he has to deal with that a lot of other fighters don't have to deal with, right? Because anywhere he goes, his name is so iconic. He's never going to really have his own name. He's going to be in his father's shadow. And I think that this was a big, this was a hard fight for him, though people won't say it was a hard fight because Brad's a tricky guy. And to pass it in this manner, it's saying that he's able to move up the ladder a bit more. And I think that because of the relationship his father and his brothers have with the fans through his career, all this stuff they do, I think that a lot of people want to see him in relevant televised fights just because they have a connection to that family. I, I mean, to be honest, too, I, I know he's the, the oldest of all of the Vargas brothers, but I mean, this is probably one of the tougher fights that any of them have taken so far. I mean, this is the hardest fight I believe any of the brothers have taken. What do you What do you think happened with Solomon? It's such a. It's a, I know guys get older and shit, but he was a, like a really talented guy, you know, ten years well, ago. I mean, look, look, you take hard fights at the world class level. You lose a few, and then you probably lose the promoter. He was with top rank. He lost his promoter probably, and then he's from Louisiana. How do you get fights? People aren't going to throw shows in Louisiana, so if you're going to come in. You're probably going to have to fight guys who stylistically are bad matchups because matchmakers are looking yep. to book fights for guys. And he just never got that upset win against a guy that matched up well against him. And now he's a little bit older fighter, but he's still a really tricky veteran. And I want to say he went rounds with very good fighters fairly recently. So he's a guy that he's sort of, he's just a tricky fighter. And I, I mean, I was talking to him this week, and I think he's had a great career. People have unrealistic expectations of what career should be. They, it's like world champion or bust. Solomon was signed to a promoter. He fought many great fighters, some possible world champions. He's he's getting up there in age, so it's like if he wants to continue to fight, more power to him. But um, I just remember the guy that when he that fought uh, Demetrius Hopkins and thinking this guy's really – got a, a, a real future ahead of him and not to take away from anything that he did or accomplished. I just, I personally thought like, okay, this guy's really got something. Well, I remember top rank used to run the top rank on true TV cards and he lost to a guy with a very confusing name um, that was trained by Abel Sanchez. That I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name. And then after that, I think his career kind of transitioned because that was kind of like a 50-50 undefeated prospects fight. And it's like when you lose those um, those prospect type fights, that's always tricky, right? Because it's like we don't say there's a ceiling, but it's kind of like a trajectory fight. So if you lose to the other unbeaten fighter, there's going to be a sentiment around ah, this guy's actually the better guy. This guy's not that great. And then I think that can sometimes linger into the fighter where the fighter doubts themselves. Then all of a sudden, it's just going to be your family members or people that love you. You're not going to see the big name trainers with you as much anymore. You're not going to see the marquee managers with you as much anymore. Some fighters evolve into another form of a fighter. Some fighters start to feel that doubt and that doubt goes from outside of the ring into the ring. I'm not saying that's what happened to Brad, but I think that things evolve and we and don't know inactivity is a big thing too right that like we don't even know what his situation was as a fighter why he got into fighting the economics of it if he had to take fights for economic purposes purposes um now we're going on a brad solomon deep dive but brad uh lost to costa mean panamarov then he was knocked out by Virgil Ortiz in 2019. But really, when you look, he 
like from 20, so 2017, 2018, he only fought twice. He upset Patty, or I guess that wasn't upset. He only fought twice. That's really then where it fight. happened is, is two fights in three years. Two fights in three years. Then he fights Virgil Ortiz, and that's just a tough matchup, right? So he fights Virgil Ortiz. Then in 2020, he goes 10 rounds with Alexis Rocha. Then he gets stopped by Blair Cobbs. He gets a split decision against an un- – he loses a split decision to an unheralded Mexican opponent in TJ. And then he got knocked out by Raul the Cougar Curiel – in December, uh, basically two years ago. So a couple of knockout losses. And I think that really when you look at his career arc, fighting Virgil Ortiz probably took a lot out of him because Virgil's a young power puncher. I think a lot of us think Virgil has the potential to be a Hall of Fame boxer. And when older fighters fight guys who seem like a generational talent who punch hard, I think they take a little out of him, and it seems like that performance kind of took a little. And also our guy, Alexis Rocha, you know, Alexis Rocha, maybe not the biggest puncher, but going 10 rounds against Alexis Rocha probably didn't help either coming off of the Virgil Ortiz loss because you got two different two different kinds of damage in those two fights. You get a knockout, and then you got 10, 10 sustained rounds that you're in the ring with. Yeah. All it takes really is a stoppage loss, right? I mean, that kind of breaks the seal on whether that's going to happen. Because once it happened, it already happened, you know? Yeah. So um, let's get into this week's fight preview. There's not a ton to talk about, you know? Boxing's doing the classic. Let's not give you much to watch. Um the biggest fight we have this weekend is in England. It's Dalton Smith versus Jose Pedraza. Jose Zepeda. Uh, oh, Jose Zepeda. So <laughs> tells you how on my game I am right now. So Dalton Smith is taking on Jose Zepeda. I guess I'd like to frame the conversation around why is Dalton Smith moving so slow? Would you say he's moving slow? I mean, I'll look up his record while you break it down, but it feels like he's not fighting that often for a guy in his spot. Well, I'll give you the activity. I don't know. I I feel like he's fighting Zapata at the right point in his career. I know Zapata has the loss to Hitchens, but I think that Hitchens is potentially a really special talent. So I'm not, I'm not going to base too much off that. I don't think we're getting prime Jose Zapata either, but I think that it is the type of rugged experienced contender. Um, that's appropriate for Dalton at this point in his career. So what I mean is I'm saying the activity. So the activity is what I'm kind of alluding to. So let me go to Dalton Smith's activity. Um, He's 15 and 0. And let's see, where is he at right here? So, I mean, in 2023, he fought twice. In 2022, he fought four times. So that's tremendous. So I wonder if he got a pay bump or something and they can't fight him as often. I mean, that in 2023, I would have kind of liked to have seen him fight two, three times if possible. He fought in 12 rounders. This is a WBC silver title. So, I mean, that basically means that he's probably going to start to get in the eliminator conversation for Devin Haney's belt if he were to win this. It just feels like he he's a fighter that a lot of people believe in. There's obviously the fight with him and Adam Azim, which is going to be a big fight in the UK. I'm just curious where, like, he goes out of sight, out of mind too much for me as a U.S. fight fan. I, I don't disagree with that, and I'm somebody who, you know, I've been pretty impressed with him when I've seen him. But you're right. I think, especially as a young fighter, you know, in activity just – out of sight, out of mind. I will say, you know, he, fighting four times in 2022, it may be an indication that, like, okay, look, we're at a point now where we want a certain caliber of fight, we want a certain caliber of opponent, and he is in a relatively talented and clustered weight class that's having a hard time shaking stuff off at the top, especially with Haney moving up, right? The belts are going vacant gradually. So it's a, a weight class that's in flux. You know, um, I, I would actually say this is a pretty big jump in competition overall 
for what he's been up against for the majority of his career. So I think that this is a, a good way to kind of just throw him in the deep end and see if he knows how to swim. And I, I'm expecting him to do well, but I'm also expecting Zapata to be a lot better than people expect. Well, and here's the thing. If Smith dominates Zapata, that does say something about his caliber. You know, it's, it's, it says something about how – because the thing is, the things that Zapata may bring, which is punching power, ruggedness, experience, those could be things that give Smith problems. But if they don't, I think that that's a good sign. And and I think also people look at Zapata as a one-dimensional fighter, right? Like I've heard a lot of people after the brand check fight look at him as like he punches hard, he comes forward, and then he has the iconic knockout of, oh, who was the guy that he – Josue Vargas – so I think a lot of people think of him as a brawler, but then you look at the Jose Ramirez fight and he was on the back foot boxing. So this is a guy that can do two different things. Mm -hmm. Probably, as you said, not the prime version of himself, but he has adjustments he can make. He's not just going to come and try one thing. There's there's adjustments. What, to me, it's going to be interesting, the physicality of the two, um, how Dalton Smith matches up to the physical nature of Zapata, who's been in with some of the biggest junior welterweights in the world, Regis Progre, Ramirez. These are big guys at that division. And I'm kind of curious to see how Dalton Smith handles the physical component of this. Right. That's that's the I think that's the biggest test of this fight, because I think there's no doubt at this point in their careers that in terms of just physical talent and tactics that Smith has the advantage. It's just going to be a matter of can he get around those other intangibles that Zapata is going to bring that he's never seen before? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that. Um, probably the best fight of the card is Sandy Ryan versus Terry Harper. Um, Sandy Ryan's having a strange career. Like I think she's extremely talented, but she's just having some weird breaks in her career that just kind of are unfathomable. Uh, Terry Harper probably really underrated because she got put on the highlight reel by Alicia Bumgardner. So it's like, I feel like people mostly in the U S just know her because of that iconic knockout loss. And it kind of that springboarded the Bumgardner a list celebrity rise to fame. Um, I think this is the best fight of the weekend. If I'm going to be a hundred percent honest with you. Can you elaborate on Sandy Ryan? I mean, Sandy Ryan's a decorated amateur she came in with a, a good pedigree from the team Great Britain. And it's just like she had the Jessica McCaskill fight, which we both like. I, I mean, it was a close fight. It was a really, really ugly fight. Want it. But it, it was an ugly, ugly fight. I mean, it was just a strange, a strange fight, if we're being honest. Uh, then I'm trying to McCaskill's look. McCaskill's got a weird style, bro. She's got a weird style. And then, and then she lost to Erica Faraz in that split decision really early on in her career. So she was moving really fast. So she had three fights. She went two six-rounders, gets a knockout, goes into an eight-rounder, gets a second-round knockout, jumps to a 10-rounder, fight, fights Erica Faraz. Faraz beats her by split decision. She jumps back in, avenges the loss. It's still a really close fight, but she avenges it, wins the unanimous decision. Gets two wins, looks like she's right the ship, and then she gets a draw with McCaskill. Now she's jumping in with Terry Harper. I'm kind of curious what the odds are saying for this fight. Who do you think's the betting underdog, Dakota, for this fight? Well, as I always say, I'm not a betting man, but I personally would have to favor Harper in this fight, having had success at both higher and lower weight classes. Um, you know, even if the Cecilia Brackus fight was not um, – her most effective. I thought she boxed pretty well. It just looked like Cecilia's physicality was a little too much. Her size was a little too much. Um, but in terms of the skill set that I think Harper's shown throughout her career, it's a little bit more diverse. Sandy Ryan to me is a little bit walk straight forward. Um, and I think that Terry's probably got the experience and the skills to, to take advantage of that. Yeah. So according to the betting websites, Terry Harper is a plus 200 underdog. So that kind of surprises me because I mean I think Sandy the Ryan underdogs the plus numbers. The underdogs the plus numbers. Sandy That's Ryan's for me. Sandy Ryan's minus three hundred. She's coming off that McCaskill performance, which I didn't think was great. I thought it was a very very close fight. You thought that 
she won the fight, but I thought that she did that classic thing where there were a couple of swing rounds and she didn't differentiate them herself. And then the judges just scored those for the other fighter because they were kind of very, what do you prefer? Um, I have a little bit of, like, I th- I see a ton of talent with Sandy Ryan. I think that she's one of the most talented fighters in women's boxing, but I'm seeing a trend of weird stuff in her career. Maybe I'm not seeing the talent the way you are. Not to say that she isn't talented. I just see her as like she's a very good fighter who's very confident in herself that's moved quickly early in her career, which hasn't always led to favorable outcomes, Um, which I don't know if that's a question of her talent or just her willingness to take hard fights. I think I think what we're I think we're seeing the same thing. I think that she I'm seeing talent. I think you actually are seeing talent, too but she's moving so quickly your expectation of the talent she has at the pace she's moving. You want to see her ready for those type of fights. So when she jumped into a 10 round fight with a game competitor, you wanted to see her at a level where she could potentially outclass that person. There wasn't, you saw a very competitive narrow margin. Um, She kind of rushed into the McCaskill fight. That's a game veteran, and it was a very ugly fight. I I have to be honest, too. I think McCaskill's style is is kind of a nightmare because the the amount that she relies on holding, just unless you have a ref that's willing to be proactive, it makes it very difficult for uh, somebody else to assert their game plan if – your game plan is also to work in close and all she's really looking to do is smother. I also, I just, not that I'm like some huge Sandy Ryan defender. I just see a talented fighter that didn't get the time to develop and get the experience in the pros because she wants, she's such a competitor in many ways we can compare her to Joshua. Let's make an over exaggerated thing, but like, she has this competitor in her where I feel like she doesn't want to just fight people she can beat. She doesn't want to just go rounds. She actually wants to take really compelling fights. Here's, well, here's a good comparison. Then Jahai Tucker, right? We know Jahai Tucker's got a lot of talent, but so at such a young age, taking, taking such difficult fights, you get more than just lessons, right? You start to get uh, like the merits in a sense. I think that we can actually say she's women's boxing version of Jahai Tucker, where she's active, actively seeking the hardest challenges when maybe it's not even advantageous. Yeah. And I think that like she's going into this fight as the betting favorite and she's taking on Terry Harper, who's a, probably one of the more underrated women's boxers, unless you live in the oh, UK. Like oh, she's a very, very talented fighter, a very tricky fighter. And I feel like a lot of people only know about her because of the online beef she had with Michaela Mayer to build up a fight. And because Alicia Baumgartner knocked her out, maybe they might know that her and Cecilia Brakis had a weird um, fight day cancellation. But she's a really tricky fighter. And she can fight in both stances. She presents a lot of problems. And to me, this is like this is going to answer questions about both of them because to me, Terry Harper is someone I think is a a really, really good fighter, but I also am looking for another marquee win for Sandy Ryan. She's putting herself in a spot of where does your career go from here? You know, because she's had kind of a loss early in her career. She had the weird fight with McCaskill. And as you say, that's a bad matchup, but now you're going in with Terry Harper. Who's also a really tricky fight. In my, my optimist perspective on that is they're both taking challenging fights. And so there really isn't a loser at the end of the day. If Sandy Ryan doesn't win this fight, sure, it may mean something about like a ceiling that she's hit, but I don't think it takes her out of the equation if she fights well, because at this point, you know, she's seven. How many, how many fighters, male or female, are eight fights in and have already fought, you know, three of the top five people in their weight class? Well, I, I've always been fond of Sandy Ryan because I watched her on Before the Bell. Right. And if you watch Matchroom before the bell, see, for you, it's during your day. So you're probably doing it, cooking a pizza, having a great life. For me, it's like West Coast. It's like 10 a.m., 9 a.m. So I can drink a cup of coffee, throw one bout on. Normally, not to dismerit, discredit anyone, it's guys that are never going to really move out of beyond the bell or before the bell. There's a lot of guys you see. Or they're 2 0. But you're, you're seeing a lot of guys that there's a reason they're not on the main card. 
Maybe they train with someone. They're they're getting a good look from the promotion. Maybe they're more of a regional talent, and they're doing a U.S. fight, and they're bringing them over here. Like there was a really good fight that Jimmy Sands. I took a liking to him, who trains with Tony Sims. He was a good fighter, on, but, but I watch these before the bells sometimes. And Sandy Ryan just stood out as someone that shouldn't be on before the bell. Amari Jones stood out to me when I see Amari on there. He shouldn't be on before the bell because before the bell to me is you're, there's a level of talent or there's a level of an outland, outstanding trait, but you need to be nurtured and developed. There's a little bit of – you're a little green, so you're either – you need to build your record, but you don't have the amateur pedigree for someone to invest and move you quick, et cetera. Sandy Ryan didn't look like she fit that when I saw her there. And I'm like, okay, there's something there. Now, am I biased that I think I'm genius guy and I saw her on a telecast and I go, okay, she looks great. I'm going to just maybe because we all have bias, right? We all have bias. So you, you see someone and you think you're the only one that sees it. Maybe that's it, but you could see that thing, right? And it could still be true. It just doesn't translate to being the number one pound for pound fighter in the sport, right? Like, you know, young Jorge Linares was like the most special thing I had ever seen. And as it turned out, he was an incredibly special fighter, but he did have gaps in his game. He had flaws in his game that led to a certain level of vulnerability. But those things that I saw in him early did wind up being true. And I think that may be true for Sandy. And I think the great thing about her is I saw the competitor. I saw a good, I saw a good attack to the body. And that's something I haven't seen outside of Chantel Cameron in women's boxing is a lot of body punching. Sinise Estrada does it, but I just don't see a lot of uh, female fighters for whatever reason going, going to the lower abs, you know, throwing hooks to the body. And that's what's going does it pretty well. Who does? Michaela Mayer does it pretty well. Michaela does it, you know, but like that's something that stands out to me as an elite trait in women's boxing is when I see people target the body, not to give away the Lukey algorithm, but, in women's boxing, I don't see a lot of body punching for whatever reason. So when I see that, I go, okay, that's a versatile fighter compared to what we're looking at. I saw her doing that with ease early in her fight, slipping off the center line, boom, slip, rip, dropped a girl. She took a knee. Um, I just saw something there. But then at the same time, most people look at Terry Harper and go, oh, Alicia Bumgarner beat her. I see someone that can fight in two stances, can box you, has a sharp jab, she can fight southpaw. She can fight orthodox. And then she can back you up at times, too. She can sit on a right hand. She can sit on a left hook. Uh, I, I, To me, this is just I, probably most people won't even watch this fight. But if you're watching this card, to me, this is a really interesting fight. Yeah, it's, it's probably the most interesting matchup of the night. And then, I mean, only other thing is Campbell Hatton's on this card. So if you wanted to. Say your piece about I feel bad for Campbell Hatton, bro. Not to that I should because I'm sure he's wealthy and healthy and successful, but it's just tough for all these sons of famous fighters to basically have to try to make your own lane. Yeah, but and, you know what? He does legitimately get better every time he gets in the ring. So I can't he's he's not his dad, right? But he does get better every single time he gets in the ring. He looks like he's enjoying what he's doing. He'll definitely lose at some point, but I don't, I also don't think there's any big expectation build up around who he's going to be. I think we're just sort of seeing how it plays out. And I think that he's, um, you know, anytime I, anytime I've watched him, I always go, Oh, he, yeah, he's better. He's better than the last time I saw him. That's all you can ask. I mean, him and Shane Jr. kind of remind me of each other in the sense where it's like, I feel like people have already written both of them off. And Shane Jr. is like one of the top middleweights in the world. And just a lot of media won't regard him as such. But he reinvented his career. He's taken great fights and really, really changed his trajectory as a pro fighter based on his work ethic and his belief. And, and, and it's a goddamn shame that he's at a weight class where it's like fucking pulling teeth to get the top 25 guys in the ring with each other. Yeah, I mean, it, it just sucks, right? And it's like he he took the hard fights to get himself in this position, and then the champions don't fight. So I'm not as mad at Neither Shane. Neither do the Wright. challengers, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's but I'm not mad at Shane because, like, he took a fight with Gabe Rosado moving up a weight class, you know? Like, that's not a fight. Like, a lot of guys wouldn't go, oh, man, let me fight Gabe Rosado away from my optimum weight class, and he did that. So – 
I mean, I look at Campbell Hatton and I see someone who, yes, there's always going to be like, oh, this is Ricky Hatton's son. But I also see someone that's trying their best, you know, and I think that's all we can ask for. Right. And dude, and I, I guarantee you play his last fight and his first fight. It's like the, the whole different guy. You got to give it to him. He's he's not a con- by any means a contender right now, but just compare it to his first fight. His first fight, he looked like a kid, like an actual kid, like a child who had not really had any boxing experience. And he looks like a boxer now. Okay. Um, final rants. Um, what what should we rant on? I guess Mungia Canelo's announced. Let me go and uh, check. There was a comment someone left. So I want to get to this comment. Um, I want to get to this. Um, let's do this. So uh, let's see. So Marlon Esparza and Victor Morales fights were canceled due to fighters not getting their visas. That makes three fights on the card directly affected by immigration issues. Man. Um, yeah, that's crazy. Um, not many questions in the chat. Um, any thoughts on Canelo Munguia at this point? I mean, we we already did our Canelo Munguia rant. I don't well, let me to- ask you this. We're going to get into a Tim Zhu, Keith Thurman podcast next week. It's going to be a big one because, they're, look, there's way too many cards next week. We got the top rank card. We got the pay-per-view card. We got Zordo fighting for a title. There's just too many fights. So, of course, this week we're going to have no fights because why should we spread it out, you know? Um, I think it's also because it's the opening week of March Madness and no promoter wants to go up against March Madness, etc. cetera. But um, – yeah, I mean, it's just whatever. But let's get into the the meat and potatoes of the issue. They released a, a preview show on that program and whatever. Are you excited about Thurman to Zoo at all yet? Oh, I was excited when when they announced it, man. I mean, I'm, I'm a big Keith Thurman guy. The critique has always been inactivity, right, for about seven years. That's been the cr- critique of Keith Thurman. Um, he is what he is at this point. I think Tim Zhu might be the best guy in his weight class, but I think that um, he's never fought anybody like Keith Thurman. And Keith Thurman's fought the best of his era. So for that, for those reasons, I see it as an interesting fight that I definitely favor Tim Zhu in. But, I mean, are you watching any of these preview shows or anything? There was an interesting clip where Roley said he's not a villain, he's an antihero, and he takes, like, a luxury car to the desert and beats up a pinata, I think, of a pit bull. Like they're doing like little features on these uh, fighters in the buildup. I was seeing if you'd seen any of these telecasts. I haven't. What were the what were they broadcast on? They're prime, and I don't quote me on it. They might be on YouTube now. We'll probably go through it, but I thought they did a very good job. Yeah, at how little them. promotion they are doing directly on Prime, because you know there's a couple of things that I watch on Prime. Watch a stand-up comedy special on Prime now and then, and when I go on that the app, there's there's no advertising around the fight at all. Yeah, and I, people have asked me, and I still haven't figured it out. People are asking where they can buy the pay-per-view yet. And I haven't gotten clear com- confirmation other than Amazon Prime pay-per-view. So there's no like link just yet to buy the pay-per-view. And buying a pay-per-view has gotten increasingly uh, difficult, Confusing. <laughs> difficult, but also unreliable. And I think that the reliability is something that boxing needs to do a better job of like assuring the fans that, no, when you buy this product, it will work. It won't be like uh, Garcia and Tank where you'll get charged multiple times for the same purchase. Uh, you won't get locked out of your Apple account for reporting it. That boxing just <laughs> boxing needs to do a better job of streamlining how people watch and purchase their product because I feel like they there's this wall of technology between the fans and the product that is not that is flimsy at best. Okay, so I misspoke. It is available on pay-per-view.com right now, PPV. You can get the pay-per-view. You can already buy it. And they have a link to the Amazon Prime video. 
and I'm not seeing it in that queue just yet. Right. So, so like you said, it's not available and it's not really ready. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm not seeing it on Amazon Prime, but if you're interested, you can go to ppv.com and you can get the pay-per-view now. But it's that's been kind of like the weird thing. They've been great to me, especially a boxing scene at providing fighters and telling stories. But kind of the side issue was there's like a lingering comment thread of where do we buy the pay-per-view and i think that that's something it's a great card it's a great card we got i think the card the fight i'm most excited about is boa chuck versus fundora i think it's probably going to be the fight of the year um it really feels like one of those type of fights the the especially with the backdrop of of boa chuck in the ukraine and everything that he has going um I just think post um, cable companies are like, yeah, yeah, that's that's what I mean. Post cable companies, if it's HBO or Showtime hosting pay-per-views through the cable provider, ever since that's stopped being the primary way of purchasing a pay-per-view, I feel like the act of purchasing a pay-per-view has gotten very sketchy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also have a cable provider we, we talked about this you don't have the ability to call your cable provider right i don't have a number at the zone that i get to call even though i pay 25 dollars a month for it so when they charge me two different times and i report it to apple and they lock me out of my account there's no one at the zone i can call and go hey man what the fuck you know yeah it's, it's tough so dakota one fight to watch this week what are you recommending people watch uh, I think the one we talked about, I think Terry Harper and Sandy Ryan is probably the most exciting fight of the weekend. But I would keep your eye on Dalton Smith if you haven't gotten to see him yet. Um, like we said, he's 15 fights in. He's fighting a guy that's in the top 15 of his weight class. Um, and I think that that's, that's worth uh, rewarding. Okay, that's our show this week. Next week we're going to do like a marathon because we've got like 15 cards. So we're going to be on all morning for you guys next week. But this week we are done and dusted thank you everybody if you enjoyed the show please be sure to share it leave a comment like subscribe dakota where can people best support you they can always support me at the slip and we podcast on youtube on instagram at itr boxing appreciate you guys and appreciate everyone in the chat as always